We're going to start with a, a passage from the book of James today. And James is the brother of Jesus, and so he had a couple things to say. Um, and it says this in chapter 1. It says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance. Say that with me once. Perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. But if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And this is jumping down to verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres in the storm. Blessed is the one who perseveres in the valley. Blessed is the one who perseveres under the trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the, the what? The crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. What is the promise from God to his people? The crown of life. The crown of life. Blessed is the one who perseveres in this life. Yeah. Having stood the test and stayed faithful, that person will receive what God has promised to those who love him, and that is eternity. Yeah. That is eternity. Let's pray as we get started. God, we, we believe that you are here, but God, we have a lot of life that we carry in these doors with us. God, we believe that you're real and that you speak and you want to and teach us today. But God, there are so many variables that we, that we bring in here. And there's so much that, that has happened even this morning that might distract us and keep us from hearing from you today. So God, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would do a supernatural work in this place and remove the blinds from our eyes. That they, you'd pull out the cotton from our ears, God, and that, that, you would be, that, that you would enable us, God, to hear from you in a powerful way today. Amen. God, that we wouldn't, that, we would, that the words wouldn't just fall on, fall on empty uh, hearts today, but God, that you would fill us and that you would open our eyes to what it is that you have for us and you'd open our ears to the word that you have for us, God, because we know when you speak, things happen. God, and what you say is. So God, we are excited for this morning. We are here on purpose. And it is in your name that we pray. And we all said, Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome home. My name is David. I'm your site pastor here at the church, and I am so excited to see you. Um, I just want to let you know that first service is going to be a hard one to top today. The 9 a.m. was on fire, and so it is, it is really exciting to be able to do this one more time with you. And one of my favorite parts of, of this um, position that I've been trusted with for as long as I've been, I'm going to be trusted with it as your, as your pastor is um, one of my favorite things is seeing you. Every Sunday, um, I, I come from a week of preparation and like study and writing and thinking about words and phrases and like big ideas and things that will inspire you to live a greater life of faith and obedience, right? Um, but then I get here, and then my favorite part isn't being up here, it's being down there and praising with you and worshiping with you and, and holding the door for you and seeing your kids and, and talking about your wedding and talking about your faith and your baptism and your journey and how God has brought you from here to there. And, and I just want to let you know that I just, I consider it such a, a treat and a treasure that I get to help push you into a new life, that I get to help push you. Anyway, I just want to let you know how much I love you. And, um, and if it's your first time here, you're like, who is this guy? Come on. He doesn't know me, but whatever. Okay. I want to. That's what I'm saying. So it's great to be back with you this morning. Um, sharing uh, of what I believe God has put on my heart to share with you today. And what's so cool is that oftentimes what God has put on my heart to share with you actually comes from you. Okay, so like as you've been, uh, as you've been saved and as you've been renewed and like the Holy Spirit living within you, right, God is actually speaking through you too to me. And so I just want to let you know so much of what you'll be hearing today has actually come from you through me back out, all right? So anyway, for the past couple of weeks, we have been taking a closer look at the different seasons of life um, that the people of Israel experienced through the Exodus. And how initially they lived in this place of captivity. They were slaves. Not at, not, I mean, not at first. They entered um, in, in good standing, but then as time changed, they, they became slaves under Pharaoh in Egypt. But even then in their captivity, we, we read that God was with them. And God was for them and ultimately freed them because of his deep love and commitment to them. 
God freed his people because, in the end, they weren't made to be slaves. They were made to be free, as Pastor Joe shared. And that same truth applied to us. Where we, as God's people today, we weren't made to be slaves to anything. We were made to be free, but our sin kept us in bondage. And so just like Israel, with the Passover, God freed us through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus. The perfect Passover lamb. God rescued us and set us on a new course to his promised land. And this is what we heard last week with, with Jeremiah McDuffie. If you, haven't, if you weren't here and you missed it, you need to hop on the podcast and watch it because it was an amazing morning. And, and what we heard from him last week was that, that God called us to be free. And what the sun sets free is what? Free. free indeed. Not to return back to the chains that once held us back, but instead to follow Jesus together into that new life of obedience, that new brave world of faith. But what we learned last week also is that being free, sometimes this freedom that we have, it can take some time to figure out. It can take some time to grow into, especially as you make your way from, from the prison, the predictable prison that you had of sin into this vast, uncharted territory of faith and belief and relationship. It's an adjustment in our hearts and our minds to go from the life we had to the life that we've been given to a life, uh, from a life of just surviving to a life of opportunity and possibility. It takes some growing up. I remember when I was in my, my mid-20s, I was um, in a very interesting season. See, my, my brother had just passed away, and I was totally broke. I had very little going for me. I had some friends and, um, and, and whatever, but not a, lot, not a lot else. And so eventually, as God speaks, right, I felt like God was... Uh, saying, hey, it's time for your life to be better. It's time for you to step into something more significant. And so I decided to go back to college because my, my dad told me once, he said, um, he's like, hey, do you like your job? And I was like, no. And he's like, well, you might as well get paid as m a whole lot more to do a job you don't like. So just to all the millennials in the room that have jobs that don't pay anything, if you don't like your job, get a job that pays better that you don't like. Yeah. Makes sense, right? Okay, anyway. But I also heard that going to college, you make upwards of a million dollars more in your lifetime if you finish a college degree. Anyone know that? Cool. So I decided to go back to college and make my life count, whatever that means. And somehow I got into UWO after being kicked out. And after a semester, I transferred into Bethel University in St. Paul. And after, uh, after all of this life that I had lived, I ended up moving into the dorms at 25 years old. Did anyone, has anyone lived in the dorms? Has anyone lived in the dorms at 25? <laughs> no, right? It was, it was an adjustment. And so anyway, I, that first semester at Bethel was all right. Um, but it was, it was interesting because I went from this life of working a job I didn't like and playing in bands, which, I, which was good, and being out two, three nights a week until like two, three in the morning, uh, eating old pizza found in the fridge, Right? I went from this old life to, to being transported into this brand new community, this brand new life where there was always food. There was always enough. And, and I had rules. I had structure. I had to be in at midnight, and my only responsibility was just to be a student. All I had to do was go to class. It was a change from the life I came to expect to a life of uncertainty now before me. So summer eventually came after that first semester, and I originally planned on returning back to Oshkosh, but my job fell through, and so I, I, um, I stayed in Minneapolis, and I moved in with my, my, aunt, my aunt and uncle in their house. And I remember moving in there in this season, right, it's a new season, having no idea what was next. Everything was new. Everything was foreign. Um, all my plans had fallen through, right, and, and now here I was feeling lost, like I'd experienced freedom in this new life, but now I was in the unknown territory, this uncharted world. Um, and, and where I, and what, what ended up happening is in that season of unknown, I started to kind of regress. I started to doubt. I started to get worried. Like, what, what if this wasn't where I was supposed to go? And I started to kind of revert back to this mentality from when, uh, before I moved. And I started to believe that I was the same guy. 
that I was before I left. I was begging for scraps at the table. And I felt like I was going it alone, never believing that things could get any better. And, and I don't know if you've ever been through something like this or if anything like this has happened to you, but I even got to the point where I was like, man, I should just go back. I should, I should just go back. Um, why did I even come here in the first place? Which, again, objectively, if you look at the situation outside of, con- like, outside of the personal feelings and emotions, um, life was totally okay for me there. I had everything I needed. I had a job. I had a place to live with people who love me. The unknown that I was in was okay for now. But the problem, at least for me, was that I still had this poverty mindset of fear. Fear of what might happen. Fear of the other shoe dropping. Fear of my past catching up with me. It was all fear this season. And and believe it or not, fear isn't always real. Because the truth is I had... I had this whole new life available to me. Hi. I had this whole new life available to me, but I still got so wrapped in the unknowns, I spent months walking in circles trying to figure out if I should go back. Because for me, I don't know if you've ever been here, the certainty of my past was in a strange way more comforting than the possibility of my future. Anyone ever felt that way? Yeah. Yeah. Reminds me a lot of the dating relationships I see today. Where instead of, instead of taking your freedom after a breakup and moving into something better, what happens? You fall back in to something steady. It doesn't even matter if you're happy there as long as it's predictable. The same goes with so many of our job situations. Like I said before, where we're like, we settle for jobs we don't like because we know that it, it affords us the thing to do what we want. And, and even though we could have something different, something that felt more fulfilling and satisfying in our, in our life and in our destiny, like we were too afraid to step into it because what if it doesn't work? It happens with our passions. Where it's in us and it's begging to come out, but we never do it because what if? It's not even real, but what if? And I think more than anything, it happens in our faith. See, we tend to settle for what's safe. We rest on this experience we we had with God at the very beginning, this moment of salvation, but we never expect more. And we never work to move beyond the freedom he saved us for because of some weird, like, misguided sense of self-preservation. Like, man, what if? What if I put myself out there and God doesn't listen? What if I feel like God is calling me to something and, and it doesn't work out? And so we parked there in this place of hesitation and fear and insecurity. And it's in this place that our story picks up today as Israel, okay? Fresh out of captivity, fresh out of slavery is making their way through this unknown. This unknown place called the wilderness to the promised land. So if you have your Bibles, follow me to the book of Numbers, chapter 13 and 14. We're going to be reading. Uh, And this is the fourth book of your Bible, just so you know. This is the very beginning, in case anyone doesn't know where the beginning is. Um, And it's written by a guy named Moses as they made their way out of captivity into the promised land. And if you're taking notes, I'd like to bring just a little bit of focus to the season that they found themselves in with a message that I want to call, Don't Waste Your Wilderness. Don't Waste Your Wilderness. And a cool detail I want to layer over the top of this morning is um, in the original Hebrew word, a friend from church um, knows a ton of Hebrew and she educated me. Um, And so this is again coming at me to come back out. Um, But uh, the original Hebrew uh, word for wilderness has a couple different meanings. There is a literal meaning, which is like what you see. It's uncharted territory. It's the unknown, right? But then there's this metaphorical layer that kind of goes on top of it. And, and, and so for the Jews, when they heard the word wilderness, it, they also read it as the place where God speaks. So we, as, as in English, we see it like, oh, it's the, it's the wilderness. But the Jews, they also receive this word of wilderness as the place where God speaks. So don't waste your wilderness. Don't waste the place 
where God speaks loudest. Now, I know you know most of the story already, the story of the Exodus, but just a quick recap to bring us up to this moment of wilderness. So again, Israel, uh, God does this incredible miracle in Egypt, and uh, Israel is free. Egypt then comes after him. God does another amazing miracle and uh, parts the Red Sea. Israel passes through. Egypt tries to follow. Seas crash. Israel's, Egypt is gone, right? Amazing. Israel keeps moving forward through the wilderness to the promised land. I want to say that one more time. So Israel is walking through the wilderness to the promised land. That will connect in a moment. Along the way, God continues to be God and provide for them and their freedom. God gives them food. God gives them water. God gives them direction. But more than anything, God gives his people his presence along the way. And at this point, I hope you see a pattern that God's track record is pretty spotless. God is trustworthy. There was mercy after mercy after mercy after mercy for Israel. But seeing this and remembering it as former slaves with a whole lot of PTSD... It was a struggle for them, just like it can be a struggle for us, right? So, so God sets us free in this, in this amazing miracle mountaintop moment. God sets us free, and he says to us, hey, I, I've, I've got something better for you. I've got a better life. I've got a better way, and I'm going to show you how to get there. I know what you need, God says. I know what you need to live your best life of purpose and significance. I know what you need to step into the future that I have set aside for you. And I'm going to show you the way. But just stay close. I'm going to show you the way. But just stay close. But staying close requires faith. Faith that most of Israel and most of us still need to grow and mature in, right? So eventually... Israel makes their way to Mount Sinai where God again shows up. Do you want to come on up? You can come on up, bud. I got a little boy. He's three. I got a little girl who's one. You'll hear more about her later. But um, oh, I'm going to have to apologize a lot for these illustrations. But So Israel, out of captivity, make their way to Mount Sinai where God again shows up. Another miracle. By way of the Ten Commandments, God gives us the law or the perfect way that he wants his people to live in the wilderness. And then from there, they continue on to the promised land. But again, all along the way, as faithful and as consistent God is with us, all along the way through the wilderness, we see this cycle, the same pattern, but the opposite from Israel, right? There's this cycle of doubt. And then this cycle of fear and then complaining. And then a miracle. And then there's doubt again, and then there's fear, and then there's complaining, and then there's a miracle. It's like clockwork, right? And I'm not saying if I was Israel, I would have been any different. But I'm just saying it's, it was almost predictable where Israel starts to doubt, fear creeps in, and then complaining, like just like I did at school, like, man, maybe we should have never left. Maybe this wasn't really what, what I was supposed to do. Maybe we should have just stayed in Egypt. At least we knew what to expect there. And then the complaining continued until God did another amazing thing to kind of knock them back into reality, right? And this was their journey through the wild. This was their journey through the wilderness, this pattern of, uh, of fear and doubt and complaining and miracles. Which, praise God for his faithfulness, eventually took him to the bank of the Jordan River. Do you think he wants to just park up here? We can put him behind the drums. See, this is what happens when people sit in the front rows. And I'm so proud of you guys for parking up front. This is amazing. So eventually, Israel made it because of God's faithfulness to the bank of the Jordan River in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. And I need you to picture this for just a moment, this, this story. Because we've got somewhere around a million former slaves, a million former slaves, that just made their way through the wilderness, through the deserts of the Middle East, and, and now they approach the River Jordan, which, by the way, was the same river that Jesus was baptized in. 
And they approach the river and they look across and to see this land that was promised to them. Just picture it for a moment. Slaves making their way through the desert, this massive horde walking through the Red Sea, seeing miracle after miracle, showing up on the bank of the Jordan, looking over and seeing this promised future. After all the miracles, after all the trials, it's right there. It must have been unbelievable. I mean, how do you even process that? And so anyway, they're there on the shore, and God does what God does again. God speaks in the wilderness because that's what God does in the wilderness. And he speaks to Moses, and he tells them, he says, send a crew of 12 men across the river to check it out and and report back. And so they did, and after 40 days of exploring this search crew, they, um, they came back and with an assessment of the promised land. And this is Numbers chapter 13, verse 27. And they said, they basically are like, all right, Israel, um, we went over, we took a look around, and we've got some good news, and we've got some bad news. Let's start with the good news. Uh, we entered the land that you sent us to explore, and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Basically, they're like, the future is beautiful. The land that God led us to is everything he said it was, and it's everything we'll ever need. It's perfect. But then here's the but. Verse 28, he says, But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. So so yeah, the future is great. The future is incredible. It's beautiful. But it's impossible, and we're never going to get in. Verse 31, we can't go up against them. They're stronger than we are. So verse 32, so they spread this, the search party, they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites, the land, saying the land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who goes to live there. Change into verse, chapter 14. Then the whole community of Israel began weeping and cried all night. Verse 2, if only we had died in Egypt or even here in the wilderness, they complained just like clockwork, Right? If only we had died in Egypt. Why is the Lord taking us to this country only to have us die in battle? Wouldn't it be better for us to return to Egypt? And then, again, remember the pattern. Fear. They they saw it. Fear. Worry. Complaining. And what does God do then? He speaks. Miracle, right? So God shows up in their midst one more time and he's like, how long, he says this to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe in me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? God's like, what else do I need to do for you to trust me? What else do I need to do for you you to know that I'll come through for you? Wasn't salvation from captivity enough? Wasn't freedom from slavery enough? Wasn't parting of the Red Sea enough? Wasn't raining bread from heaven and breaking rocks so you can drink water enough? What more do you need? For me to prove that I am with you and the future I have promised for you is possible. How much more do you need to see before you'll believe? And I think it's it's such an amazing question from God to Israel, but isn't that the question for us today? How much more do you need to see to believe? Well, the story wraps up with God sending Israel back into the wilderness for 40 years. One year for every day they explored this promised land but lacked the faith to enter it. Back into the wild for 40 years before the next generation of Israel would be allowed to enter. It's a lot of story. From freedom into promise. It's a lot of story, and I appreciate you sticking with me through it because I really think it speaks loud and clear to what so many of us are facing today. We're just like Israel. God saved us, and it was awesome. God bought our freedom, and now we're here making our way through what's next, through the unknowns and the highs and the lows, and and here we are, and we're living day to day. The past behind us, we know it. Eternity just beyond the horizon, and, and God is with us in it. God is with us and he's leading us to our best life, to this unique opportunity and possibility of reflecting glory in God uh, all around the world. And initially, 
this first step out of captivity, man, it's all excitement, isn't it? Wow, I never thought someone could love me like this. Wow, I never thought I would feel free. Wow, I never thought God would, would care about me and do this for me. It's almost euphoric. But then just like Israel, as we, as we go further and further away from the world that we used to call home, these feelings of euphoria, they start to fade, right? And as we make our way down from these mountaintop moments with God, we get distracted and overwhelmed and even beat up by what we find in the wilderness. And then before you know it, what we once saw is this incredible journey towards God's promise to us. What was once this incredible path into the future, it now starts to feel like a punishment. Where you wonder like, man, I, I, like I did in school, man, I, I thought life was gonna be different than this. Like I thought God was bringing me somewhere better than where I left. And ever since I left, it's gotten harder. Has anyone ever experienced that? I thought God was bringing me somewhere great, but now what I see are obstacles and limitations between right here and what God wants for me. I mean, why would God save me? I, I've said, why would God save me from captivity only to bring me into the wilderness to struggle? Has anyone ever felt like that? Why would God save me from captivity only to bring me into the wilderness to fail? Man, that is real life stuff, isn't it? But as real as some of these emotions might feel, I think we're confusing what God promised and what God is doing in this story. Because, in, and here's the good news for anyone currently that finds themselves in a season of confusion or struggle or hurt or pain. Because the truth is, God never brings his people to the wilderness. We read this earlier. God never brings his people to the wilderness. He brings them through it. You hear the difference? God doesn't bring us to our struggle. He brings us through our struggles. The wilderness isn't our destination. It's just how we get there. God isn't bringing us to the wild. He's bringing us through it to get to what he promised. And, 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 and this is it. If there's only one thing you take away today, let this be it. God believes in you. And he saved you because he believes in you more than you could ever believe in yourself. But to find the life that God dreams for you, that God dreams for all of us, we need to first make our way through seasons that help us grow up. Seasons that mature our faith so then we finally get to the shore and we see the promised land just across the river. We're brave enough to take it. Yeah. See, for Israel, from Egypt to the Jordan, they wasted their wilderness living on borrowed faith, a faith they inherited. They wasted their wilderness from miracle to miracle. They wandered from captivity to freedom to promise, and they made it. They made it, but the truth is they never grew up along the way. They were always complaining, seeing the wilderness as this unnecessary, unfair punishment from God, when all along it was intended as a mercy. All along the wilderness, this season, it was a place for God to speak to his people and prepare them for the future he promised. Which is why when they got there and saw that it was good but lacked the faith to go in, that's why God was so frustrated and sent them back. Because they needed to grow up, just like so many of us need to grow up. Because for their whole story of freedom, all they wanted was the, the path of least resistance. They wanted what God promised, but they didn't want to do the work to get there, and so they'd whine, and they would complain until God came through time and time again, wasting their wilderness, waiting for miracles instead of maturity. See, their minds were so focused on what God could do for them that they never thought about what they should do after. All they wanted were these mountaintop moments of faith, but tell me something. Look at the screen a second. What grows on the very top of mountains? Nothing! No growth happens on the top of a mountain. Things only start to grow when you make your way down off the mountain and into the wild, into the valleys of this life. Have you ever wondered, I was thinking about this yesterday, have you ever wondered why God didn't just make Egypt the promised land? 
it would have been a whole lot faster and a whole lot easier, right? Because it was like, all right, miracle, the plagues, miracle, boom, they're free. Egypt is now out, like they're, they're going to wander through the wilderness instead, and Israel is going to hang out in the place that they just spent 400 years building. So why didn't God just give it to them? Check this out. You need to hear this. It's because God knew that Israel needed their season in the struggle to become the people they were saved to be. God knew that they needed the unknown to mature into the type of people that could, with faith, step into the future that seems impossible. God knew that Israel needed to face the wilderness because, listen, nothing great, nothing good, but nothing great ever comes easy. No. Resistance brings resilience. And this is what God wanted for Israel's story. And in the end, it's what he wants for ours too. Resilience and perseverance to run the race and finish because this, this resistance, it prepares us to step into a greater life of glory and faithfulness. The wilderness of this life builds our faith to see the promises of God and to take it. I want to say that one more time. The wilderness of life, I'm preaching to myself. The wilderness, the struggles in this life build us up, strengthen us and mature us to actually see and believe the promises of God and then take it. And isn't that just what we heard from James at the top of this message? That we're to see the trials of life, these struggles as refining moments of our character and faith. That we should consider the wilderness pure joy because it produces perseverance, and perseverance gives way to maturity. God says in that verse 12, I love it, blessed is the one who perseveres in the wilderness. Blessed is the one who perseveres in the trial. Blessed is the one when, when that, that perseveres when things aren't great, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So don't waste your wilderness. God wants to use it, and he wants to use it to make you strong. It's not a punishment. It's meant to prepare you and to bring you into a supernatural life of opportunity and obedience. So don't waste your time in the wild. Because your wilderness is the place that God speaks. We're going to be finishing up in just a minute if the band wants to come up. Don't waste your wilderness. I get it that it's an adjustment. It's an adjustment to go from a life of predictability to a life of the unexpected. And, and I think most people don't enjoy when things are unknown. Last night, um, oh, you, uh, okay, I'll tell you now. So we, there's been a season where my daughter isn't sleeping well. And like, she might sleep for three hours and then wake up at nine and then we're like up with her till two in the morning, okay? And then, like, we hold her for the rest of the night because we don't know what to do. So, like, people don't like the unexpected. And last night when I was trying to go to sleep, I couldn't sleep because I, I just didn't know if she would wake up. It's, it, it's not even real, right? It's a fear that doesn't, it's, it's like a worry that isn't even in reality, and yet I, it's, I still let it control me. It's an adjustment. People don't like when things are unknown. I think if we took a poll, most of us would want a stress-free happy life of prosperity, right? That sounds awesome. Unfortunately, though, this is not the life God said we were saved for. I think most of us would be satisfied with a life of average, a life of just good enough. But that's unfortunate because God has saved us for a life of significance. We were rescued from captivity for a life of adventure to pioneer through the wild. So when we finally get to the promised land, we'd be brave enough to, and strong enough to go in. We weren't saved just to jump from miracle to miracle to miracle, living off the, 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 the faith of someone else. No, we were saved to use our wilderness to be a miracle for someone else's pain. And that's why we go through it. Like Paul says in 2 Corinthians, he says that we go through trials to experience God's comfort. We go through hard times to experience God's encouragement so we can be comfort and encouragement to others and theirs. We were saved for more, so don't waste your wilderness complaining. 
Don't waste your wilderness complaining, but it's so tough, right? I was sitting here this morning even thinking like, well, cool, man. Don't waste your wilderness complaining, but how do you not complain when things aren't great? How can you begin to see our season of struggle and confusion and pain? How can we see them as the pure joy that James seems to think they are? Because again, the past couple weeks in the Johnson house have not necessarily been peaceful. Not a lot of sleep, a bunch of sickness and, and like developmental leaps and all this amazing stuff with our kids that we love so much. And, and the truth is, it's not like we're living in Syria or like a bridge just collapsed on us or anything like that. Um, so I have to remember it contextually, but I also don't wanna minimize the wilderness that we go through. Because the truth is, we felt for the past month like we were wandering. It's been hard to remember the promise when you're living off three hours of sleep. And so in these moments when I'm holding her and she won't go back in her crib, I sit there thinking like, okay, I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to know how to do this thing. So I'm sitting there going like, all right, God, I know you speak in the wilderness. The wilderness is the place that you speak. So God, what are you saying in these times where I am not feeling joyful? God, what are you saying here? And how can I start to see this time, this short season as, as, a, as a place of preparation and joy? And, and in the end, I, I'm not sure that there is an easy answer to that question. But I think there's something to what we see in the book of James and in, in the Exodus and all throughout scripture and even built into that word wilderness, right? Uh, this theme of God speaks in the struggle because because God is with you in the wild and Israel missed it but I think as we look to Jesus and the way he handled his time in the wild it always it reminds us that he always brought it back to this truth of God speaks Jesus made it through the wilderness because he always held tight to what God had said in scripture he made it through because he fought back with the word of God. And I tell you what, it's not, this isn't like an instant transformation, but the more you practice, the more you remember what God has done and what he promises to do, the more resilient you become when you face resistance. And, and, and every step through the wilderness built on the truth of God, it helps us mature into the people we were freed to be. And so I'm not gonna try to convince you that the wilderness is fun, just like I'm not gonna convince you that doing push-ups is a good time, all right? But I can tell you that it's important. And honestly, this is all we got. This is life, this side of heaven. It's not gonna change. So I guess, the sensing some wilderness right now. So the question I just wanna leave you with is, what are you gonna do about it? This is all we got. Are you gonna settle for what's safe, wandering through the wild, setting expectations from the life you left behind? Or are you gonna let the mercy of God change you? Are you gonna let the mercy of God refine you and grow you and mature you as you make your way through the wilderness to that promise? The wilderness is coming either way, so don't waste it because God wants to use it. God wants to use it. Stay close and listen because God is speaking into your struggle and bringing purpose to your pain. Stay close because whatever it is that you're walking through, he promises to be with you in it. The band is gonna lead us in just a, in just a minute. And they're gonna be leading us in a song that, that they had written that I think speaks so clearly to this situation that we are processing to gain. But before we do, this is gonna be a kind of a moment of response so you can sit or you can stand, you can, you can do whatever you feel like you need to do that God is leading you to do. But I just wanna encourage you one more time, not to waste the days that God is trying to speak to you loudest in. Because God is here and God promises his presence with us. It doesn't mean it's easy. It doesn't mean it's gonna go fast, but at least you know you're not alone in it. 
Don't waste your wilderness. God wants to use it. Let's pray. God, we believe that you are who you say you are. We believe that you are speaking to us even now in the wilderness we all walk through in this life. And, and God, I just ask that you would continue to open our eyes and our ears to what it is that you're saying. God, we know that you are the great comforter. And that, God, that you want to speak into our pain purpose. And you want to speak into our wilderness the wonder of who you are so we can come out the other side stronger. So God, open our eyes to see the purpose and the plan in the places that you have us. God, we trust you. We have no other choice. You are a proven, a proven track record for us. So God, help us see. Help us stay close and listen. It's in your name.